we'll learn a little bit more about Yellowstone, and we'll have a quiz on it next week. <laughs> Turn your cell phones off. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to say that. Turn them off, please. Okay. Um, the, a lot of these slides are uh, slides that are used for a talk that um, a number of us give. We each have our own different versions to the fourth grade class? Six. Sixth grade, grade class. Middle school. Middle school. Um, and those kids are bright, too. And they knew more, they know more about geology than I knew. Uh, I was into my career before I knew as much, uh, my academic career before I knew as much as I did. So, but, so some of this is aimed at a uh, younger audience, but, uh, and some, of, I think a lot of this, a lot of you are very familiar with what Yellowstone is. So some of this I'll last you pretty quickly to get to some more maybe substantive things we can talk about, the parts of Yellowstone that we really don't know about, uh, for instance. Um, so that's just a little bit of background, but you'll sort of see how this is set up for the sixth grade uh, class of middle school. So you know, we ask questions, what is Yellowstone? <coughs> Yellowstone is a volcano, and you know, it's a super volcano, we'll talk about what that is. Uh, one thing that you need to remember is really that everything you see up at Yellowstone, in one way or another, uh, even the you know, vegetation and the fauna, really there is a link to um, the geology, a direct link to the geology, a direct link to the fact that Yellowstone is what it is. It's a, it's a big volcano. Uh, you know, certainly, as you're well aware, everything that's hot up there uh, is a result of the fact that Yellowstone sits on a massive amount of hot rock. We'll talk more about that. Um, and everybody knows, I, likely, that uh, you know when you have molten rock, it's in the subsurface. It's magma. When it's on the surface, it's lava. You know, there's yellow uh, tetons in the background there. So just some fundamentals that I need to go over with uh, the sixth graders and you know, ask, what is a volcano? And I you know that seems like a real simple. Uh, thing to answer. It's, it's, yeah, it's, I, I don't know, we're not going to go through that here. I don't want to spend time on that. You know, but it's, it's basically a place on the surface of the earth, you know, where stuff comes out. Uh, hot rock, hot gases, um, you know, the escape to the surface. You know, that's the fundamental definition of what a volcano is. So, and volcanoes are all around the world. And we'll talk in a moment about how important volcanoes are to actually our very existence. And as you can see here, they're not um, spread evenly across the surface of the Earth. They're very discreetly uh, located. Um, and, uh, you know, so we ask why, and they know. You know, they say, well, it's plate tectonics. Uh, you dummy. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and, you know, they get that. Um, you know, at sixth grade, they've been through stuff that, but, you know, there were still people some of us are old enough to remember that plate tectonics wasn't necessarily totally accepted uh, when we started our academic careers. Um, so, you know, the only thing that's really probably missing on this in terms of distribution of volcanoes is, is like this here, where it's very better studied. All of these um, plate boundaries where in the ocean where extension is occurring today, where new plates are being created, there's undoubtedly this kind of distribution of volcanoes everywhere along those ridges, too. Um, so um, they're at plate boundaries is, is the bottom line, almost, almost exclusively. Um, you know, so you know, what, how do plates interact? Of course, they do strike slip. There's compression, uh, usually subduction. Uh, and then, of course, extension. This is usually mid-oceanic ridges, though we do see it onshore as well. East African Rift Zone is a good example of that. The other type of compression uh, is much less um, evident on the surface of the Earth, and that's, for instance, the Himalayas, where you have a continent-continent collision. So you know, that does occur throughout geologic time. It's very, very important. But other than a few places, um, the Himalayas being the primary example, compression it results in subduction of the oceanic plate almost always beneath the uh, the continental lithosphere. Can we ask questions during? Sure, if they're short, otherwise I'll push them to the end. Go ahead. Uh, the mid ocean um, ridges, are they uh, 
the chicken and the egg thing, it, are they there because the crust is thin, or is the ocean there because there's a mid-ocean ridge? Um, maybe you're asking um, what is causing the subduction? Uh, why are the plates going apart? Uh -huh, and why in that one? And that's one of those things that uh, there are know. some very good arguments about. Ron okay. would probably have one answer. Uh, <coughs> there's an answer. Here's an answer. Uh, you know, here's a different answer. Um, you know, there's basically there's probably some, it may be a combination. It's either subduct um, a convection in the in the mantle, or there's a pool as the cold slab out here. Uh, far away from where it's created uh, is uh, subducted down into the mantle. So they talk about mantle pool uh, versus uh, convection in the mantle, maybe it's a combination of both. Ron, you want to throw in your two cents worth? No, it's uh, not really, but I, I think you're explaining it properly. Uh, along the west coast, the most interesting thing that we have is that we've actually got in Southern California Version from We're going to talk, you're going to see that in, in all of you in, in momentarily, actually. And it's interesting because like in Bar Barstow area, there were, used to be a lot of volcanoes. Now there are no volcanoes. And it, it pretty much uh, relates to the transition from uh, subduction to strike slip. Yep. And we're going to explore that with a little bit animation that painting the water put together. I was just going to put in a quick plug for one of the uh, pioneers of plate tectonics. Her name was Tanya Atwater in the 60s. Come back because we're going to see some of her awesome. group's work here. So Yellowstone is a volcano in, you know, in that it's a result of very hot rock, um, relatively speaking, uh, in the subsurface. And, you know, and I, I have some trouble with this because it shows the hot rock is a very discrete body, and that's not the case. You know, there would definitely be a gradient of temperatures, and most of the hot rock is not magma either. It's hot rock, it is not mold. Um, but it, there's no doubt that the reason Yellowstone is a volcano is because there is a large body, there are large bodies of hot rock beneath it. So, you know, I always do this, uh, you know, what do volcanoes do? I'm not gonna go through and ask all around the room. You know, but these are the things that uh, define what happens at a volcano. This, of course, is a stratovolcano. In other words, it's a cone, uh, and that's what most of us think of when we think of volcanoes. The Yellowstone doesn't look like that. We'll talk about that here. Uh, but most of the world's volcanoes look pretty much just like this, what we call stratovolcanoes, and these are the things that happen. Um, at Yellowstone, you see all of these except uh, flank collapse features, and you really aren't in a position to have lavas or mud flows so if we're down the sides because you don't have a big strato volcano. The rest of these things in particular, pyroclastic flows, especially ash, ash flow flows, which come from these eruption, eruption columns of clouds, are the major features that define a super volcano of what Yellowstone is. So we go into this, you know, so Yellowstone doesn't farm one of these beautiful strato volcanoes like this. Um, it farms broad deep caldera, which is what? You know, it's a collapse feature. And you know that is a very distinct caldera at Mount St. Helens. Um, and many volcanoes around the world think of Crater Lake in Oregon is another beautiful example, and there are many around the world, uh, have features like this. So after an eruption, it's not at all atypical to have that voided space cause collapse of the overlying um, volcano. Um, so, you know, this is Mount Helens before, Mount, Mount St. Helens afterwards. Yellowstone, though, um, is, so this is a nice cartoon here of uh, what Yellowstone sort of looks like, what the major features are. The main thing is this exaggerated in terms of elevation, so there's, you know, gross uh, exaggeration in terms of, um, you know, vertical exaggeration here is quite high. But 35 to 50 miles across is uh, the scope of the caldera. We'll see more of that. You know, there obviously is partial melt, uh, but below there's the hot rock. And it does come for reasons that we can argue about from, um, you know, from the mantle. Uh, or even deeper. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you 
arguably male plumes. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but there is obviously there's uplift, uh, you know, there's stretching, there's deformation of the crust there like that, and then there's all these things, uh, you know, it's hot springs and geysers and all that stuff in between. So, you know, after you erupt, you know, you tend to get the collapse and calderas forming. You know, that's exceedingly typical. So, and this is a, you know, an aerial view, if you will, though it's a, it's a drawing of Yellowstone and the most recent caldera, the 641, 642,000 year old one. And again, it's about, you know, 30 plus by 50 plus miles um, in diameter, uh, in extent. And you know, look at, you can see there are mountains all the way around that caldera. There were undoubtedly mountains that went right through here as well. And what happened to them? You had the eruption, you had the collapse, um, and you know, there went the mountains, either down or up and out. John, uh, yes. how long did it take for a caldera like that to form? Uh, the short answer is um, nobody has ever seen one do that. <laughs> Very seriously, yeah. uh, we'll talk a little bit about the most recent one or two or three. Uh, well, Mount St. Helens. Hel Hel Mount St. Helens is a straddle. That I mean that basically happened instantaneously, uh, in, from a geologic sure. perspective. It happened as that uh, eruption uh, ceased. Um, you know, you had to blow out off the side of Mount St. Helens, and then the top of the mountain just fell down into the into the void that was left by the erupted material. So probably it doesn't take um, very long, but you know, I've seen uh, people talk about how long did the eruptions at Yellowstone last? Hours, days, weeks, months? And the short answer is we really don't know. I mean, there are some studies that suggest that, for instance, the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff, which is 2.1 million years ago and a whole lot of stuff, may actually be a couple of eruptions. There is some evidence that actually there may have been an eruption, a period of quiescence, and you know, they can see some evidence that suggests that. So short answer is we don't know. Um, it is uh, one clearly one of the world's super volcanoes. And uh, super, the term supervolcano is becoming, uh, creeping into the technical accepted literature. Um, it was a term, uh, it might have been BBC that you know, first uh, really started using, I'm not sure they first coined it, but it's been accepted now largely um, to uh, define any volcano that has produced at least a thousand cubic kilometers of erupted material best we can estimate it. You know, and by comparison, Mount St. Helens was a half of a cubic kilometer of material. The largest eruption in recorded human history is Tambora, 1815, that caused the year without summer. And that was, you know, it affected the whole world, global climate, for at least probably a couple of years. You know, it was about 160 uh, cubic kilometers of erupted material. Um, you know, there have been three recent supervolcano eruptions, so actually the Mesa Falls one uh, really doesn't qualify by the 1,000 cubic kilometer uh, criteria, but still, everybody says there have been three recent super eruptions, 640 or 641, uh, 1.2 million, 2.1 million. Now, I'll ask you to note that this is uh, 0.9 million years between these two here, like this. And it's actually uh, you know, 1.5 million years between super eruption and super eruption. So uh, that uh, is something you should take away. So this is the small one out here to the west, Island Park. This is the old Huckleberry Ridge uh, eruption. This is the most recent caldera uh, underneath Yellowstone Lake out to West Yellowstone. Little Falls is right about there. So. Um, now, how much material was erupted? So we're already talking about that. So here's Tambora, 1815. Here is Mount St. Helens, uh, 1980. Um, you know, this is Mount Masma, which is Crater Lake, uh, 7,600 years ago. Uh, so here are the um, one, two, three most recent Yellowstone major eruptive events. And of course, the monster is the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff, 2.1 million years ago. Um, and uh, this is uh, you know, the most recent one. 
and that's a thousand. Well, that figure there says a thousand cubic kilometers, um, and then you can see that the Island Park one was only about 280. So by the definition of a thousand cubic kilometers, it's not a super eruption. It would have been a bad day to be near it, but it wasn't a super eruption. <laughs> so, and again, Tambora caused the year without summer, actually several years of global climate change. And, um, you know, so here's the question. What actually did the Yellowstone eruptions cause? Nobody's ever seen one. Um, but there, uh, Sue and I got to see the evidence uh, of one of them here just a couple of weeks ago. So we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, so if you went and tried to find the layer of ash that came out of Mount St. Helens, it would be, you, you could look for it in an area like this, even though ash fell at least as far on windshields as Denver, Colorado, I know that. Um, so, you know, that's a long <coughs> way um, from Mount St. Helens. This is, this is the rough area, outline of the area where you could go today. Here's a 2.1 million year ago eruption. You could go um, down uh, into Texas, you could go to the West Coast, and you could find uh, layers of that ash from that volcanic eruption from over two million years ago. Uh, Houston um, has a layer, if you, you know, dug a trench or drill a hole in the right places, you could find a layer of that ash from that 640,000 year ago eruption. So these were things that spread ash clearly all over, you know, what is today the United States, clearly would have uh, ejected material into the upper atmosphere, and clearly would have had a major climate change for years. I mean, you can see that from just the fact that Tambora, what I think it says 160 cubic kilometers of material, did have a very major climate change globally for a couple of years. So, um, you know, certainly a global effect on climate as well as life where the ash fall was thickest. And as evidence of that, uh, if you really have any doubt about the significance of one of these, Sue and I visited um, Nebraska's Ashfall Fossil Bed State Park here just a couple of weeks ago. I was aware of it, I had never visited it. Um, and as I think you'll see, it's really well worth a visit if you ever get a chance. Um, it is uh, a site, uh, a fossil bed site, uh, that results from one of the ancestral Yellowstone calderas 11.3 million years ago. And as you'll see, there was an estimated uh, one foot uh, of direct ash fall at that uh, northeastern Nebraska site. And if you look at this painting of what life was like uh, in northeast Nebraska 11 plus million years ago, uh, what you see is that it was like the African savanna in many ways. There literally were lots of rhinos, uh, not the kind of rhinos we see today, different ones, but they were very prevalent. Uh, multiple different, multiple kinds of horses, camels, different kinds of, uh, you know, uh, something like pronghorns or not pronghorns, you know, there were uh, uh, mastodons running around. Uh, there were a lot of things that don't exist anymore, didn't exist even before the mass extinctions, extinctions, you know, of, you know, 15 to 20,000 years ago. Totally different fauna at that time, at least in large part. And where was North America located during that, what is it, 11 million years ago? Uh, it, it, it would have been oriented exactly like it is. And at uh, an inch a year, 11.1 uh, million inches closer to uh, Europe than it is today. You can do the math on that and see how many. <laughs> you know, see, see where that puts it. So, you know, uh, shrink the North Atlantic by 11.1 million inches times two would be, because Europe's going the other way, whatever that comes out to be. Um, so this is what um, that fossil bed site looks like. They've got, uh, how well you can see that, you know, they've put a great big, basically barn over the top of it, if you will, and have preserved, like down at Di Dinosaur National Monument, a lot of the actual excavation in place, so you can see um, you know, what's going on. So you know, here is a, one of the adult rhinos with the baby rhino right here behind it. Here's a, one of the early three-toed horses. So you know you're walking along uh, this uh, uh, you know this way <coughs> here, and you're looking down onto this fossil bed here. And what they believe this was. Let me go back to this. They believe it was a water hole. You know, there's good evidence of that. 
um, there's more than 12 inches of ash there. Remember, the water would be in a low spot in a depression. So by both probably by wind and action of water, you know, the ash collected flowed into this low spot, which was this uh, water hole. Uh, you know, the ash is spread over, you know, thousands of uh, cubic or square kilometers. So there's no place to go. So um, when they dig this, uh, what they find is the small, more vulnerable life at the bottom. Turtles, frogs, uh, birds and things are at the bottom. They die first. Um, and then the larger uh, fauna, like the rhinos and the horses, die later. And they have some estimates, you know, a couple of days to a week or so later, they think the larger animals basically just fell over and died. There's a little bit of evidence of uh, scavengers, um, predators, you know, tearing some of these uh, uh, bodies apart, but only a little bit. Uh, and they haven't actually found any of the uh, it's not dire wolves, those are much later, but the big wolf-like creatures and things, large canids um, that were here as well. That, they see footprints actually in some of this ash, but they haven't found any of the predators. Uh, but most of these are remarkably undisturbed uh, and remarkably well preserved here. Uh, so the color we're looking at, is that, have they plastered it or is no, it actually the color of the ash? It's the color of the ash is, is what it is. No so these are ash. all herbivores. These are all herbivores, yeah. As opposed to like La Brea, which is the exact opposite. Yeah, and that's a different in yes. kind of environment, okay. for sure. Um, How firm is that ash? Very firm. And if you look back here, you can see somebody's out there walking around on it. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, but it's relatively easily removed from the, from the fossils. Um, but it's more than firm enough to walk around. They were, tr they were chasing, they knew something got in that night. They were chasing, it was either a possum they hoped, or they were, <laughs> they were hoping it wasn't a skunk. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently they had skunks in that report, and it's not a good, uh, good thing to have happened. So this is, um, these are some di or, you know, displays that are on the wall there inside that building. And what you can see um, is that, so here's where Jackson is. Here's where the Nebraska State Park is at, Ashfall Fossil Bed State Park. And here is the eruptive site, and here again, you know, more detail. So Yellow, uh, Jackson uh, you know, sits right about here. There's Yellowstone today. Um, here's you know, the series of calderas uh, that represent the motion of uh, you know, these ancestral Yellowstones as they become younger and younger and move into the uh, craton. And it was this one here, the Bruno Jarbridge supervolcano from you know, 11, 12 something to 11.3 or something years ago is, is the site from which they have clearly dated uh, and, and mapped that ash fall. You know, that's what some of these other triangle triangles are, is sites where they have uh, mapped, actually, this particular ash layer. Um, so, um, you know, that's the 12 inch boundary there. This is the 24 inch edge. And I don't think they put a, you know, that, I don't know what that is, 48 inches, whatever it is, it was a lot uh, of ash. And of course, you can see the prevailing winds are, Took me out of the west, and, and you know that's way where things typically go from uh, and, and around are, here. These are like loose. This is loose ash, not welded. These tuff, are not welded tufts. Which you would find much closer. You yeah. would find probably welded tufts closer. After it's gone that distance, it's cool. Yeah, you can't. Be now these are ash falls, <laughs> so these are not uh, New Erdans uh, clouds <coughs> of ash and gas rolling across the um, you know, the landscape. So again, you know, but you know, we always ask the students, is, you know, we don't want them to walk away. Uh, and I don't, I, I didn't have these photos of the fossils. I don't know that I would show them to the sixth graders actually. Because <laughs> somebody would be asking, well, have you found any body, human bodies in there? <laughs> Humans ran around with dinosaurs, right? Yes. There, we won't go there. So, you know, is this typical? And of course, the answer is no. Um, you know, the last major eruption is 640 or 41,000 years ago. Um, but they have identified at least 70 eruptions that have occurred at Yellowstone since that time. And that's why the caldera is not so evident in Yellowstone. It's mostly filled up with hundreds and thousands of feet, actually, of mostly basaltic, in some cases, some rhyolitic lava flows. And most of those would have been like Hawaii. You 
probably could have gone up if they would let you get there and, and driven a car up and, and watched it. In other words, not terribly violent. Uh, you know, we talk about there are hydrothermal uh, explosions as well. Uh, you know, and again, if uh, water meets hot enough rock, uh, it will flash to steam. And, uh, you know, for instance, if you lowered Yellowstone Lake by 10 or 20 feet, you probably would have hydrothermal explosions because you're taking a lid off of it. And that may be what happened at Mary Bay here. Maybe you can see the, the crater that's in Mary Bay. Uh, and those of you that went on the um, field trip to Yellowstone with Lisa Morgan, uh, we went down and walked along the northern shoreline. Who was on that? Mike, you were? You weren't. Elizabeth, the Beavers, me. Is that it? John. Um, but one of the things we got to see, and you can see on the northern shore here, uh, near Storm Point, just inside, right there, is you can see about a two meter thick uh, layer of material that was ejected from uh, the Mary Bay event. Um, it's uh, got, it has clasps in it, boulders in it that are a good meter uh, across, very angular. Um, it's a very, very distinct, uh, you know, no time event. It uh, happened essentially instantaneously. It would have been a very bad day to be at the northern uh, northern shore of Yellowstone Lake when, when that happened there like that. So some of those can be very, very large. So again, uh, you know, here's the sequence of craters from out here on the Oregon-Nevada uh, border. Um, you know, has it always been where we see it today? No, it started out here. So here is a digital elevation model, which really uh, is just about like a picture from space. You know, imagine you're up there in space on a perfectly clear day. It's late in the day, so the sun's back here like this. It really gives you a great look at the landscape. <coughs> And of course, the things that we want you to see is this is one of the more prominent things actually in North America. If you were looking down in space, one of the more prominent features, and that is the Snake River Plain. If you look here, you know all these little pimples all over that plain out there. Those are volcanoes. They're shield volcanoes. You know, a few of them are rhyolitic domes. Um, you know, so this is a plain that has been formed by the you know the collapse of, of of one caldera after another to arrive at this uh, geomorphic feature here, which is today the Snake River Plain. You know, the initial Yellowstone was way back over here. Uh, you know, Jackson is right there, and the Yellowstone, of course, is, is there today. Um, you know, and you can see that's high elevation. Um, so this is the result. You, know, you can see these mountain ranges, and there is no doubt that these mountain ranges went through where today the Snake River Plain is. And they are gone as a result of these volcanic eruptions over the course of the last 16 million years. John, help me out with something. <clears throat> was that location in the lower left-hand corner physically where Yellowstone is today, or did the hot spot move underneath? <coughs> Say that question, we'll come back to that. Okay. I got, I've got a short-term memory. I'm sorry. Uh, well, that's all right. So, we'll, you know, so yeah. Um, so Yellowstone farm, you know, 16 plus million years ago, um, you know, this is to uh, you know, plant the seed that basically we're arguing as a uh, scientist about what causes Yellowstone. You know, there is a very large camp of people that believe that there are uh, things called mantle plumes, with Hawaii being the uh, prime example, uh, and that Yellowstone is one of these. Um, for reasons that we'll get into here in a little bit more detail, there are other people who say you're full of crock when you uh, espouse that. Uh, you have to explain Newberry as well. We'll look at that. There's subducting uh, slab here of oceanic uh, crust, um, and uh, you know so maybe some fairly complex processes, uh, maybe even not that complex in the upper mantle or what caused Yellowstone. And different people have different uh, beliefs about what happened uh, for, in a lot of cases, very good reasons. There are a lot of different data sets that go into the interpretation, the study of what is Yellowstone. So, you know, these sort of depict maybe two sort of in member uh, possibilities. And they're, they're models, is all they are. So, what we do know is that, you know, the, the heat that is underneath Yellowstone is very significant in a lot of ways, not the least of which it causes a bulge in the crust 
and you know you about 600 meters of elevation gain if you drive from here up to Yellowstone today. And so you know we asked the students, you know, does 2,000 feet matter? Um, and this one they don't always uh, come up with the immediate answer on, but you know, of course the answer is yes. Um, as you well know, if you've driven into Yellowstone in the spring, right after they plowed or blown the roads out, and you've got walls of snow that are 15 feet, 15 feet high. There's a lot more snow up there. It stays a lot later. Um, and if you go back in time when the Earth was a little bit cooler during multiple ice ages, that snow did not all disappear in the summertime. And it built up to layers of ice that were literally around 4,000 feet thick where Yellowstone Lake is today. Um, and it flowed down out of Yellowstone, some to the north, uh, certainly to the west, uh, down to the Snake River Plain, and down into uh, Jackson Hole, down where the, uh, you know, the valley of the Snake River is today. It couldn't flow to the east because you have a rampart of mountains there, you know, the Absaraka Mountains. Um, are you know, 10, 11 plus thousand feet, 12,000 feet high, and the ice can't go that way. So, and how recent was the last glacier in Jackson Hole? And you, you probably all know that. That you know, was only about 14, 15,000 years ago. Um, and what, so, so here is Yellowstone Lake. Here's the Montana Wyoming border, Idaho border here. Uh, here's Jackson Lake, so town of Jackson is right here. And 130,000 years ago, so if we go back not to the most recent, but the Pine or the Bull Lake glaciation, which was the one before the Pine Dale, it reached, it flowed right through where we sit today, and was probably 12 to 1500 feet thick right here at the town of Jackson. It didn't quite go over the top of uh, the low spot in Snow King here above town. So you know, here's the boundary of that greatest extent of ice that we. Uh, 130,000 years ago. And the darker, uh, more solid blue here is the outline of the ice sheet from 14, 15 to 25 or so thousand years ago. Uh, that all flowed basically uh, out of Yellowstone and surrounding mountains. What's the striped stuff on that? Um, th these are uh, elevation, yeah, estimated elevations. The, the brown and blue. Yes. Yes. Yeah, no, yeah. no. It's, it's just showing the uh, extent um, of that earlier glaciation. Okay. So they're using this solid blue for the most recent, and they're using, um, you know, so I get this out of the way, you know, these, are the, this, these are the boundaries uh, of the oldest, or, well, that, the farthest extent that we know of, which was the 130, the Bull Lake glaciation. Yeah, I'm looking at it, the little blue things that are sticking. Those are valley glaciers that are valley flowing. Glaciers. Gotcha. Into um, okay. into this area here. So um, so um, so plate tectonics, you know, associated with vol volcanoes, volcanism, um, th and this is a really important point to get across to the students, uh, but to you as well. Here, um, volcanism is crucial. Plate tectonics is believed to be absolutely crucial to the very existence of life on Earth. Um, what do volcanoes do because of that subduction? Thank you, we should have done that a long time ago. Um, volcanoes recycle material from the surface of the Earth after it is subducted into the mantle. Um, and everything, all life on Earth, um, you know, must have you know, carbon, oxygen, water, and other elements that, that volcanoes erupt. Uh, and without this recycling, Almost certainly, Earth would be a lot more like either Venus, which isn't good, or Mars, Mars, which isn't so very good either. Um, neither of those planets have active uh, plate tectonics. In fact, we do not know of another planet that has a plate tectonics. Um, there actually probably is plate te a form of plate tectonics on um, one or two of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, where the crust is actually kilometer thick ice. And there is evidence of actually, actually that there be a form of plate tectonics uh, on those, those moons. Now, I was trying to remember the plate tectonics on the Earth, the, the debate is now, it got started about 3.8 billion years ago. Um, that's another uh, topic that uh, there's hot debate about actually. 
you know, I've seen people who are serious scientists say it began as recently as one and a half billion. Um, I don't personally believe that, and there, I, there's just an article out, Sue was pointing it out to me here this morning, I'd seen it as well. Um, there's some evidence, uh, I don't remember all the details of it, that it actually probably began about 3.5, 3.6 billion years ago. Uh, I personally, I believe the preponderance of evidence yeah. is that it's very early. Um, you know, it, it's not going to happen initially. You know, when, as that surface starts to cool, you get uh, you know a layer of basalt all over. Right. The globe is covered in basalt. John, I didn't understand the connection between having ice a kilometer thick and plate tectonics. Um, at Yellowstone. No, on no, 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 Jupiter's no. moon. Jupiter. Oh, 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 sorry, why, why sorry. That, that, why is the fact that it's got ice on the face? It just measure. has a crust. It, it has a crust that instead of being rock, um, it's very cold out there. Um, there isn't significant atmosphere on most of those moons. They're, they know now, we, we know now that there's a lot of water out there. Uh, and we know with certainty that the crust of a number of these moons, Enceladus, um, Europa, and one other one, uh, the Mm, no, not Io. Um, that's the one. That's the pizza moon. That's that's a different uh, crust on that one. Uh, but there is a large um, percentage of water making up these moons. It's light. It's on the basically on the surface. There's probably almost certainly a rocky core to it. Um, and they have very direct evidence now that there are actually oceans, liquid oceans. They can see geysers spray, spouting out through fractures. In, in some of the ice. They've actually sampled it with uh, um, at least one. Uh, which, is, uh, which is the one that just dove into uh, Saturn? Cassini. Uh, Cassini. Um, uh, anyway, so there's very solid evidence uh, of what is there. And there, but when you look at the imagery of some of these moons, you can see features that look like uh, subduction zones. Um, and the, we know because the surface of the, these moons um, is ice, and you don't see big craters on it that is re being recycled regularly. In other words, there's just not craters all over it. If you look at the moon, that's one of the ways you can tell um, uh, you know, how old the surface of the moon is by the density and the nature of the craters. And that you can look at uh, Venus that way, you can look at Mars, you can look at any body that doesn't have plate tectonics and has a hard surface. And, learn things about uh, processes on that body. So, sorry. One, one way to think about plate tectonics is without it, we probably wouldn't have continental continents. Uh, that's the next point right there, <laughs> as, as a matter of fact. You know, assuming, uh, setting aside the fact that you need to recycle the gas, the water, the various elements um, that are being subducted, um, if you just took a static earth and let weather do its thing over the course of time, uh, the surf, the uh, dry parts of the earth would all be eroded and we, you know, they'd all be down in the bottoms of the oceans, you know, the basins like that. Uh, the continents would disappear underwater. Uh, we'd be in trouble long before that. Uh, but, uh, you know, without, you wouldn't have continents if you didn't have plate tectonics here. And, and there's a lot more to the story uh, about plate tectonics and the continents, the cratons, and and we may actually touch on that here at the end. So the bottom line, I really want the students to walk away with this, if nothing else, without plate tectonics, without volcanoes like Yellowstone, we would not be here. Almost for sure, you know, I feel confident, uh, as do most scientists, that without plate tectonics, without volcanoes, life on Earth would not exist. So, um, you know, there's a lot of work going on, a lot of great things being learned. You know, it's just a couple of years ago that uh, Bob Smith's team down at the University of Utah you know, did imaging that uh, allowed them to say that they think the uh, magma body, the magma chamber, and it's mostly still hot rock. It's not magma. It's only about uh, you know two and a half to five percent actually melted rock. It's a lot bigger than uh, people guessed beforehand. Uh, you know, so there's and there's a lot of different uh, kinds of, of work being done. Uh, and you know, so the question becomes: uh, Every time there's been all kinds of articles about Yellowstone recently in the press, you know, when is, is it ended up just a pop tomorrow to erupt and 
and you know we're all doomed, uh, just like those uh, rhinos in uh, northeastern Nebraska. Uh, you know, I can't say no. Um, you know, and we've already gone over this. It certainly would have affected um, life, not just nearby, but literally globally. There would have been an impact. Um, again, you know, 2.1 to 1.2 is 0.9 million. So this is 0.6. We haven't had one for 0.6 million years. Um, so like the BBC movie said, we're doomed. We're doomed. Um, and you know, that was the, the theme of that movie there. Okay, you know, but um, two points basically don't make a trend. And for the people who um, you know say six hundred thousand years is the magic number, they, you know, they're just ignoring the fact that you know this relatively little one in the middle has a uh, you know, point nine million years between here and here. Um, and this isn't even a super volcano eruption. It'd be a bad time to be around, but it's not even a super volcanic eruption. So. Um, you know, so you have to look at all the data, and the bottom line is the people that uh, print these um, excep exceptionally dramatic uh, and factless um, articles on the, you know, the, the next super volcanic eruption don't have a clue what they're talking about, almost without exception. Um, you know, and you know, certainly, you know, the chance of any given year of a super volcanic eruption, and again, there hasn't been any eruption in Yellowstone for the last 70,000 years, is incredibly small. You're more likely to be hit by a meteor than you are to be killed by a volcanic eruption in Yellowstone. Um, you know, this is, I uh, get into a little bit more detailed stuff here, and I'll show this to the kids. Um, yeah, this is, you know, the track of Yellowstone. Here's the Snake River Plain. Green is low, brown is high. Uh, the plate is actually moving in this direction, about two and a half centimeters an inch a year. A perfect uh, time to ask, uh, why does the Snake River Plain make a boomerang and yet the, I don't know Save if it. I've ever heard that. Oh, um, save it. Okay. It's, um, it's part of other stuff that we're going to look at in just a second okay. here. You might show more on that. No, you can, you'll see that in a minute too here, though we already. So, I um, mean, there's a lot of volcanism around the periphery, excuse me, seismicity around the periphery here. The seismicity in Yellowstone is probably directly related, much of it, to uh, gases and, and uh, fluids moving in associated with the volcano. These are all associated with a basin and range extension that we'll look at more here. Notice there are essentially no uh, earthquake seismic events in the Snake River Plain. The reason for that is because it's too warm, it's too hot. The rock is too plastic. So deformation occurs for sure, but it occurs plastically as opposed to brittly. And that's, what's, that's, what, a bulk, that's what an earthquake is. It's a brittle um, rupture uh, of uh, of the surface of the earth. So Yellowstone is one of, if not the best monitored volcanoes on earth. Um, you know, so uh, Yellowstone is here, Idaho Falls there, Salt Lake somewhere, somewhere down in here. Um, these are varying types of monitoring stations, not just for Yellowstone, but they are, all of them contribute to our understanding of, and monitoring of this Yellowstone system. It probably literally is the best uh, monitored volcano on Earth, um, and we're learning a lot about how volcanoes work, how they operate as a result of, of this monitoring. And if there was going to be a super eruption or any kind of eruption, and again, the last 70 have been kind of kinds you could drive up and watch, we would know uh, well before it happened. So you get back to the question then about, you know, what is Yellowstone? Uh, is it a hot spot? Uh, like uh, Hawaii is uh, uh, in some cases theorized to be, and some people strongly believe that Yellowstone is that. Is it something that is more complex that involves processes maybe only in the upper mantle? Um, these are some of the data, and there are dozens, if not, if not more, types of data that you have to incorporate. But I want to give you a sense of the complexity of some of the data sets that people are working with. This is, um, so here's the coast out here. So you know, there's the mouth of the Columbia River. We're right here. 
This is volcanism that's associated with the basin range extension that we'll take a look at here from Atania Atwater Amnation uh, in just a moment. And what I want you to see is there is a lot of volcanism that began about 16, 17, 19 million years ago. It's a very complex, different types of volcanism. Uh, but what you should, uh, one thing you should note here, I mean, so you have to explain all of this, I think, in my estimation, to explain what Yellowstone is. But, you know, take a look at this. So here's Newberry, which is very recent volcanism. Here's Yellowstone, which is very recent volcanism, relatively speaking. And if you look at these circles, you see numbers under those. And what those are are the dates of um, major volcanic events, you know, starting 16 million, 17 million years back here, going this way to Yellowstone, starting the same time, the same place, and going the other direction to Newberry today. Um, so it is part, Newberry is part of whatever Yellowstone is. It's very hard for me to say that Newberry is not part of that. Um, the fact that all this volcanism begins um, at the time this basin range extension reaches this part of uh, Western North America also leads me to believe that if you cannot incorporate the inception of this volcanism in your model for what Yellowstone is, you're not providing uh, you know, a thorough answer, a real answer for what Yellowstone is. So this is just a glimpse um, into the complexity of the data that uh, lie behind your study, anybody's studies of, of Yellowstone. What was your green? I don't know. I, it's, I think it's uh, extensional. Um, it's uh, rift zones, okay. different type. So what I want to do here now is, I should have had it up already, but that's okay, is show you this animation here. We'll look at it a couple different times. So this is an animation that Tanya Atwater's team put together of the last 40 million years of the western um, part of North America and the eastern Pacific. We'll look at this a couple different times. I'll stop at a couple different places. Um, and let's see if I can stop it right there before, well, so let's just play it again. So, so what you see, and you know, the arrows show it, you know, what you see is um, this, the red there, the red line is a spreading center. So oceanic crust is being created at that spreading center and moving to the east and moving to the west, away from those spreading centers. This is the subduction zone that was along the, the western coast of North America for um, probably well over 100 million years, maybe well over 100 million years. Um, and you can see that, you can see the shape of the states in here. Uh, she, she and her team put those on there to show you that um, today, Western North America is extended. That's how you get the shape of the, you know, the states weren't here uh, uh, 30 million years ago. Um, so these boundaries are just projections on ancient um, uh, topography of North America. And watch what happens then. So at this point, you've begun to override that spreading center. Uh, and you've begun to destroy that subduction zone. Subduction continues to the south, it continues to the north, and it still is occurring today off the coast of that, uh, Vancouver, Oregon, Washington. So it's still occurring there. That's why you have the Cascade Volcanoes, that chain there. There's major subduction occurring off the coast, northwestern coast of the U.S. But look at this orange that's starting to show up here and watch the development of this and these lines in here will fill out. Yeah, just um, a second, too. The, the big red line out in the ocean there. Uh, which one? East west is a transform. It's a transfer. Transform fault, which is another way to think about that as a zone of weakness in the crust. Just hold that thought. So here we go. And what you're beginning to see is the extension occur in the Western North America. You begin to see that extension propagate into the interior of the craton. So let's just let it go on here. And you know, so be, you know, right about in here is when this brown reached here, which is where Yellowstone uh, initiated, and Newberry, which sits off to the west here. 
This is the um, a Rio Grande Rift, uh, which uh, is a major feature that most people don't even have never heard of. Uh, that's why the Rio Grande River starts in here and flows down here to, to Mexico. And notice that it extends all the way up into Wyoming. And if you drive down past Bags through Craig and points south of there, Yampa and all that kind of stuff, you see volcanics, uh, recent volcanics that are associated with this, uh, this rift zone. So let's let this play out again. And you can see at uh, about five million years ago, the Snake River Plain is uh, approaching where Yellowstone is today. And you can see that this is migrating out this way. You can see the extension and the state. You see Baja a little bit Yeah, you see Baja and move north. And, uh, um, so, um, let me run it again. Let me, so, you know, right about here in the you know, 20s, you know, 25, 28 million years ago, you begin to override that subduction zone. Um, and you know, here, 15, 16 million years ago, this extension has really reached up into here where Yellowstone begins, you know, right, right there, like that. I remember the Tetons supposedly started about 10 million. So, and you can see this tongue of extension, which is the Snake River Plain, uh, moving to the east. And, you know, here it is just, you know, like three or four million years ago, you know, the, that's Heisey uh, caldera is out here underneath where um, uh, Rexburg, et cetera, is. And so, so there's where we are today. So I wanted to, you to see how um, we've gone from a subduction zone along the entire western U.S. to and compression in the western U.S., which formed the mountains that most of us love across Wyoming, except for the Tetons and except for the Absaracas. Um, those were all formed by the Larabite event you know, 65 to 100 plus million years ago. Since then, though, after you override this uh, subduction zone, you cause this extension, uh, this basin and range um, extension, which is occurring today in the western U.S. That's why Jackson Hole is here. We are in the eastern edge of that extensional regime. And that's why, I don't know if this is fine enough to do that, Jackson Hole is actually, we sit in the eastern edge of this uh, basin and range extensional system. John, when you have an extension, where does the material come from to fill in that space? It's uh, not all lava. That's part of it, remember, it, remember the whole western part of the U.S. Has got, was crumbled. Right. There was a whole lot of compression going on as the whole North America was headed pretty fast to the uh, east, or to the west. The west too. And all that's happened is once it got on the other side, North America got on the other side, a lot of those extensions just started undoing, so they just started being pulled apart. The crust is thinner now than it was before this extension started. Without that, uh, to some extent, yes, though there's a complication to that that I'm not going to get into here today. So I wanted to show you this uh, movie, if you will, this animation, this 21 second animation. It really is best as anything that I have come across really explains this concept of this transition from compression to extension and why it, it causes questions to be raised then and possible answers about why some of these things that we see in the western US, US exist today. And in my estimation, it is, um, it, it, it is seminal to um, the cause of whatever you believe it is, the, the, the existence of this Yellowstone system. So let's go back. Um, and I'll just minimize this. So let's go back to the PowerPoint here, and we were right here. So I, I really want to get into some things here now that definitely uh, we don't get into with the sixth graders. And uh, so this is some computer modeling. It's not, um, so these are not pictures of the Earth um, as it exists. They are models of 
what people think the Earth looks like in the Western U.S. So there's a cross section A here, here, you know, A to A prime, so here to here, right through Yellowstone. B to B prime, here to here. Uh, and this is again not as detailed as that map I showed you before. But again, they're posing the question, how do you explain Yellowstone starts here right in the middle of this stuff. Newberry goes this way, Yellowstone goes this way. Now they look like not quite mirror images, but call it that, mirror images of each other starting right here. How do you tie all that together with um, the volcanism, the extension that we know that starts at about this time? I think you have to. One other thing I'll point out is it's grossly exaggerated, but look at this cross section here. The A prime is back here. And again, there's an exaggeration, but look how thick the craton, the, the crust is, the lithosphere is to the east. And again, it's shown as basically zero thickness out to the west, which is a gross exaggeration. Uh, but they're also showing that here north to south, that there's a zone, a very thin crust here, in the competition, but right basically underneath the St. River Plain. So what they do is they model then what would happen um, if you, again, it's a model, what, what happens if a plume um, comes, so here's uh, six, 30 million years ago. We know there's subduction occurring. This is long, 30 million years is well before Yellowstone starts by about you know, 14, 13, 14 million years. We know there's a subducting uh, plate, the Farallon plate. Here's the thick uh, craton lithosphere. The, so the red is a hypothetical uh, plume of hot rock coming up from deep in the mantle. You know, here's the subducting um, uh, oceanic crust. Note that this is east to west. So west is the upper part of each one of these diagrams. So we're looking to the west in each of these. And what they do is they model this and, and they, one of the things they show is that you have to account for the fact that if there's a plume coming up, it has to interact with the subducting plate. There's just geometrically no way to avoid that. You know, so what is the result of that when they show, based on the modeling, that at least in part it probably does punch through here like this. But the bottom conclusion is, if you look, you don't see all kinds of red stuff up here. Their conclusion is that the cold subducting slab is the predominant factor. They, they basically say you cannot explain you know, if you believe Edwards and Lou, Edwards is the postdoc working for Lou at uh, Illinois University, and he is a world-class modeler of uh, things um, that we, we see, putting together models to, with all the parameters and the data that we know provide uh, constraints on, on the way things actually work. You can believe it or not, uh, but their uh, conclusion is that you cannot uh, invoke a mantle plume to explain Yellowstone. You can believe that or not, and there are a lot of people, um, it's, it's vigorously argued, let's just let it, let it go with so that. This, this plate coming out from the west is going underneath. It's subducting, it's remember we looked at, yeah. it's how just far, a subduction zone. How far zone. east does that plate go before it starts turning molten again? Uh, well, it probably doesn't turn molten. Well, um, it uh, will be slowly absorbed into the mantle over the course of hundreds of millions of years. Uh, we have tomography, which is imaging uh, underneath North America as a result of Earthscope, which is the largest seismic array that's ever been uh, installed on Earth and it migrated across North America. And the answer is that we believe uh, we see, or they believe, uh, they see parts of this abducted um, uh, oceanic plate all the way under almost the east coast of North America Ooh. today. So you, they go down and they break off and you then start subducting again. So you can get pieces. Um, it's not just, it just doesn't go down to the center of the earth. Mostly they probably go down about 650 kilometers and there's a density change and they probably stop right there, most of them, probably. So, so we're floating on this thing, basically. Well, the cross, the lithosphere is much less dense, relatively speaking, than the mantle uh, rock. The oceanic crust is also denser than the, um, than the lithosphere of the continents, uh, but it is less dense than the mantle underneath. So, you know, those relative densities might not seem like a whole lot. You know, 2.6 uh, 
six, five, or seven for you know for for a lot of the lithosphere here in the crust or the mantle of the um, continental uh, crust. Uh, you know, 2.8-ish uh, out for the basalts, something like that. Somebody can correct me if I'm a little off on that. Whereas you get down into the mantle, you're talking about 3.0 uh, grams per uh, you know cubic centimeter. And so uh, you know, so it's not vast differences, but those are very significant differences when you're talking about a, a, a planet. So when it goes all the way to the east coast. Well, remember, North America is actually overriding it. Yes, it's overriding it, but is that affecting the continental region at all? Um, we uh, off the beat question. Uh, well, uh, the, the short answer is that we know less about processes in the mantle than we do about the surface of Mars or even the backside of the Moon. <laughs> uh, it's much easier to see and study. We have a rover. We're gonna roll, we have had three, and we've got two that are still rolling around on the surface of Mars. <coughs> for instance, uh, so. Um, we have no way to um, go down and look around and send probes down to into into the mantle. You know, deepest well that's ever been drilled was on the Kola Peninsula, and it was about forty thousand feet, as I recall. Forty-six thousand feet. Thirty-six thousand feet. 36, 36, feet. Um, the deepest well in North America is probably just a little over thirty thousand feet, um, and um, we're not even close to. Uh, drilling into the mantle. They've talked about doing that in the through the oceanic crust, which is only, say, 10 kilometers thick, something like that. Um, but it's tough enough to drill geothermal wells around volcanoes for geothermal projects. Can't imagine what it would take. Do you have a question? Yeah, I can sort of understand the arguments of the Yellowstone trend, but how can a protagonist of plumes deal with the nuclear trend going in the opposite direction? Uh, damn good question. Um, and uh, let's, let's, uh, you can kind of see a couple of things on there. <coughs> uh, if we go back to one of these, um, you know, there are a lot of, and these are sort of old models, yeah, even uh, right now. Though I think uh, somebody who believes in mantle plumes, you know, something like this, that's, that's what it is. Uh, you know, somebody who starts to um, talk about, well, we have to factor in the subducting plate here, the Juan de Fuca plate, you know, so we need some sort of back circulation in here underneath the uh, craton uh, in front of the subductive plate, or maybe because the plate's going this way, it's actually rotating, you have, you have cells in the upper mantle that are rotating the opposite direction here, you know, so you've got drag on the mantle as a result of the uh, subductive plate here. There are all kinds of things. Um, that um, are, are invoked. There are all kinds of data sets from helium-3, helium-4 ratios to uh, trace elements of various kinds um, that you, if you really want to dig into this, you have to get into. No, I thought you kept to the fifth grade level. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is way beyond uh, what into. I show the sixth graders. Give us a now, question. John, just a question. So on this model, you look at zero years, the source of Yellowstone would be that slightly light pink zone? Well, they're saying it can't be. Um, because no, no, the one right under the surface. No, they're not uh, trying to explain Yellowstone. What they were trying to do here was test whether you could use a mantle plume um, and invoke the geometry through time that we know existed. We know this uh, subduction. Uh, was occurring, you know, actually well before 30 million years ago. It's been going on for uh, 150 million years, uh, and then different times even before that. But so all they say, what they basically say here is that yeah, you can you can punch a little bit through this thing, um, but it heals, um, and the cold subducting slab predominant predominates uh, is much more important than a hypothetical mantle plume. That's the conclusion of these researchers here. Uh, you're saying it gets, not, snow, gets snuffed out of plume. Right. If there is, that's basically what they're saying. It wouldn't work. And so their, in their final conclusion is, they don't say it quite in the same <coughs> words, but hey, guys and gals, you got to go find something else. That's their conclusion. This doesn't work is what they say. 
I just want to show you that, you know, this is recent stuff. This came out in January of 2016, last year. This is very recent research. Why couldn't a plume punch through it, though? Well, they say, well, it, it, it can distort it, it can punch through it here, uh, but the slab keeps subducting and it just can't cut this, it can't cut this, uh, you know, blow torch thing through this subducting slab. It doesn't work, is their conclusion. You have to argue with them if you uh, want to get into yeah. the very details. But quite frankly, next I would, week I would look at that large blue blob in the last 20, 10 million years and say, really, it, it maintains its integrity in that zone of heat? They, um, you can see uh, pieces of these uh, subducted uh, plates literally all the way beneath pretty much the east coast of the U.S. You can see pieces. Of the, remember, North America has been moving west since the uh, mid-Atlantic started opening, and that started happening in the, basically the Jurassic. But so, you said these plates break up. Why couldn't a plume come through one of the fissures? Well, the, the, oh. key, the key thing to remember is this is a mathematical problem. Right. And you the, can make them any way you it's, want. It's kind of as accurate as horseshoes and hangers. Yeah, I was going to say you can make them anywhere you want. Well, uh, yes and no. no. There, are, there are constraints on these. Of course. The point isn't that this is the answer. The point is that there, you know, I, I showed you the, you know, the onset of basin range extension, extension in the western U.S. You have to understand that and you have to involve that to explain what happened. You have to explain all the volcanism. You have to explain the fact that Newberry and Yellowstone start as one event and move in opposite directions. And a simple plume just doesn't appear to do it in my estimation. There are people I who think, believe it. I think part of the plate broke off. There's a cracking. Up comes the speed. Go talk to Mr. Lou. <laughs> <laughs> the plate keeps moving. Well, I know. But that's, but that's why, well, that's that that's why Yellowstone has moved. That, that, that's somewhat along the lines of Peter Wars. Well, then why does Newberry go the other direction? Is there a is there a series of calderas associated with new areas? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and and they truly <coughs> just move away from each other's strength. Peter invokes the uh, transform or the yeah, the transform fall as a zone of weakness, and somehow things are seeping up that. And how it goes both ways, I can't argue. But there are existing uh, weaknesses, uh, ancient features in the crust in the lithosphere that may be opening up as a result of this extension. Um, and you know, this is a model, I think, from one of Christensen's papers. Uh, and in this case, what they're invoking are circulation cells in, in the mantle, in the, in the upper mantle here. And one of the things I want you to look at and see here is how thin relative, again, this is a cartoon or a model, but how thin, relatively speaking, the crust is to the west, how thick the crust is basically at Yellowstone and points east of there. It is much, much thicker, it is much, much older, it is much, much colder, um, and that's one of the reasons why some people question whether there will ever be another Yellowstone to the east of where Yellowstone is today. Um, again, um, I'm probably not going to be around to prove that right or wrong, but there won't be. Uh, but uh, yeah, just to give you the sense that this is not, um, you know, there is not an absolute answer. Uh, there are many, many data sets uh, that people in, involve when they try and explain what is happening to what Yellowstone is. There is not a simple, um, quick answer that everybody agrees on, far, far from it. What, what was the blue thing on that? These are circulation cells in the mantle. And John, the thinner part of the crust to the west, is that due to the basin range extension? In other words, absent basin range extension? Yes and no. Would it be as thick as it is? I, let me show you something else here, just a little bit. I have another slide that I brought along just for that purpose. Um, and so, um, you know, it is a super volcano. Um, you know, we don't know. Um, if it, when, or even if for sure it will erupt again. There is very considerable discussion, is probably too mild of a word, about <laughs> what Yellowstone is and what causes it, what caused it, what causes it. We are developing the tools now, especially with things like EarthScope, 
If you go online and Google Earthscope, you'll see this seismic array that moves across North America that is finally allowing us to basically begin to look into our own Earth in ways that we were not able to before. So we're actually beginning to get be able to do some quantitative assessment of not just arm waiting of uh, you know, what's going on processes and we're be, being able to put real constraints on the models uh, for what might be the reasons behind Yellowstone so we can and other things so we can say no nope, that doesn't work well how about this and so forth but you know, clearly all the data and all the answers are not yet in so when you use you know yellow volcanoes are covered life on earth uh, enjoy visiting when you, you are walking inside of a volcano you know, then I stop for questions and comments. But um, since there's been so much about super volcanoes here recently, I'll take just a couple of minutes and uh, talk about them to the extent showing you where super volcanoes are mapped. And again, these are thousand cubic kilometers or greater. So if you have here, uh, a couple in North America, uh, underneath um, Naples. Uh, Naples um, Lake Toba, New Zealand, and other places here. And here's a list from Wikipedia, and I sorted this by youngest to oldest here, of uh, the EI volcanic explosivity index. Um, that's a it's a technical uh, scale for uh, volcanic eruptions. And ones now above a thousand cubic kilometers are EI, EI eights are super eruptions. And the most recent one was in New Zealand 26,000 years ago. The biggest one was down in um, southern Colorado, northern New Mexico, La Garita, San Juan Volcanic Fields. And that one produced uh, an estimated at least 5,000 cubic kilometers of erupted material. Not at one shot, but over the course of uh, some time when that was active here at the San Juan Volcanic Field. And, you know, Yellowstone fits in here. Um, I see. Here and here. Um, Can you go back to your map for a second? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the this was a really big one. It's the most recent, really big one, and that's in Indonesia on Sumatra. And if you look up Lake Toba, look up uh, seismic imaging or not seismic satellite imaging of that, you'll see that's a hell of a big caldera with a great big volcanic cone in the middle of it and a lake. Um, and so, yeah. Okay, so my question is, is uh, how do we define the open loop volume? That's a thousand cubic kilometers right now. Look at the, the steps in Russia and the Columbia Plateau on volumetric. Those are a different type of eruption. Okay, so you've got the other qualifier that they're an explosive eruption. And, and again, this only goes back. Um, uh, 28 million years, essentially. Uh, you know, the Deccan traps and the Siberian traps, uh, you know, those are 65 million years ago, and a little bit more, a little bit less, and then um, 250 million plus years ago. It's the youngest, it's the biggest, youngest um, uh, effusive uh, basaltic uh, flows like that. It's a very large one, even on the global so scale. Not a, these, yes, these, okay. those types of volcanic eruptions do not give you gotcha. um, an explosive event like this. They're effusive, in other words, they flow over, um, in all cases, uh, many thousands, if not millions of years. Okay. So different types of eruptive events. I didn't really want to get into the different types of volcanoes. So the, so the Columbia ones, and where's the hole in the ground that stuff came from? Well, it's not a hole that came out of fractures. Cool, cool. And that's what some of those uh, long linear features that you saw um, on that map of the well, volcanics the actually point. were. There's a whole lot of material that came out of that. A lot of different and flowed, flowed uh, tens and even hundreds of kilometers in well, distance. On, on his map, it was that big blue blob. Mm -hmm. And that big blue blob, our buddies, Shell Oil Company, grew a well right in the middle of it. 12,000. That's about how thick the volcanics are, the basalts are out in the Snake River Plain. You can uh, see with seismic the base of those. That's that's part of how they identify the caldera. That's the definition of them. There are other things uh, as well. 
So there's been a recent, um, some recent uh, crap in the news. <laughs> About, uh, we're going to stop all these uh, gold darn uh, super eruptions. We're just going to cool them down here like this. I, I can't believe that actually NASA has a plan, as uh, the article said. This was an April Fool's Day. And uh, no, it's a little, it's, you know, we're wrong time of year for that. So I, you know, I don't know. I didn't try to look and see who Brian Wilcox is or what the heck he is. Um, you know, but he, uh, he said, you know, we're just going to, we can drill wells around the periphery of this and then. Um, you know, we'll just pump water down there. Yeah, it'll turn it into ice. All dark. Hot water. You know, we're gonna have an infinite source of energy here because we'll just be turning <laughs> billions of turbines with all this. Hot. Anyway, um, you yeah, know, so this is from the same article. Actually, most of it's just the crap about you know, NASA's gonna fix uh, Yellowstone. You know, you'd have to drill wells that we don't know how to drill. Um, in truth. Um, and let's say, well, the, the bottom line in here is there are literally thousands of cubic kilometers of hot rock. Um, and, um, you know, I'm certainly not qualified to do the modeling of how much uh, cold water it would take to cool thousands of cubic kilometers of hot rock. But I can tell you that it's uh, far beyond anything that anybody's ever even thought about trying to do beyond, well, he's thought about it, obviously. Yeah, I think it would boil up. Did you put Smith's comment at the end of that or two? <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, Smith had about a two sentence yeah. comment that was yeah. like, they Bullshit. need to stick to their knitting sort of thing. <laughs> so, um, you know, so, you know, this article says, you know, I, they just want to, you know, make you think, well, don't worry so much about this. You know, the odds of a super volcano eruption in any one year is vanishingly small, and that's true. Uh, you know, it's about the same risk as uh, you know, a large asteroid. Uh, you know, one of the things this doesn't um, that doesn't include though is the fact that there are a lot of these super volcanoes around the globe. The last one was about 26,000 years ago here. The one before that was about 70 or something here in Indonesia. Um, the uh, one here in Italy is bubbling away and there's people seriously worried about um, that one erupting, whether it be a super eruption or not. But you know, there's a city basically sitting on top of uh, that volcano, which in the past has erupted enough to qualify as a super volcano. The point that gets me about this putting water down there is those of us that were in Hawaii and actually went the boat over to see ah, mm. the lava coming into the water. Ah. So you want to talk about an explosive reaction. That's right. it, right? Bob, there. this gets back to your question, yeah. which I almost got away from, which is um, uh, you know, how is the what's the crust like out here basically? Yeah. And the answer is that the crust out here is a lot younger. So Yellowstone is on the edge of the Wyoming <coughs> province which is a very thick, very cold, very old uh, piece of um, continental crust. So if you look at the ages of these, they go from, um, from well, this is, a, this, is maybe a bit, this is maybe a better one here. It's the same map, but it doesn't have all the pretty colors. And what you see is that this is young stuff. Um, you know, it's, uh, this is all Phanerozoic, so within the last 500 million years, this, this crust out here and out here. And as you go into the core of the continent, you see ancient blobs of continental crust that have been welded together. They've been slammed together by, and you, you preserve the seams, if you will, where those bits of continental crust were slammed together back in the past. The point of this, though, coming back to Bob's question, is that this rock here is thicker, older, colder, than all this stuff that was welded to the western side of the U.S. in the last 500 million years, and mostly much less time than that. If you read that, like the, that whole Wyoming ledge is the oldest stuff in the, in the it's the Archean stuff at the very bottom of your scale. Yeah, it's um, basically probably two and a half to three and a half billion years old. The oldest dated stuff is actually up here off of Hudson Bay. Um, on the east, uh, basically eastern edge of that, it's uh, they've got some dates they think are uh, uh, close to four billion. Um, but Ron Frost thinks he has evidence for uh, what could be the oldest rocks on Earth in Wyoming. Um, it gets it, it gets to uh, looking at zircons and dating uh, you know, dating dates from zircons. Um, but 
that's that's a whole other talk, and we're going to try to get here to do that at some point. And I might finish with this. This is um, from some stuff that uh, Risma did back in '99. I grabbed this out of Jillian Folger's uh, presentation that she gave a couple of years ago. It's in a lot of different things. You can go back to the actual paper. So it's a cross section from Europe through Greenland, uh, you know, past Iceland, which is here. Uh, through North America, through Yellowstone, and then on out into Western U.S. and out in the Pacific. And uh, so these are velocity variations. And basically, blue is fast, it's, and which means cold rock. Uh, red means slow, is slow rock, which means um, hot rock. Um, so the colder it is, the faster uh, the velocities are through it, you know, simplistically talking. Yellowstone is at the edge of this, as we saw on those other maps, well, is at the edge of this very old, very cold, very dense, very thick craton. Um, and so there's a real question as to whether Yellowstone, whatever that system is, can migrate further into the craton. We don't know. Stick around a million or two million years and we'll have the answer to that. So Bob, that's the answer. It is, um, it is thinner, for sure to the west and was thinner even before the extension started. So the velocity is you saw over here a rock any rock. No no no. What's so so looking at sound waves going through the That's what I was trying to do. Energy yeah. moving yeah. through yeah. through yeah. the rocks yeah. there like that. I know. I'll take credit for so, it. <laughs> so that's um, what I've got and that's my story and I'm second to it. <laughs> <laughs>